Frankie, how you doing? You good? Not bad at all, thanks. Not bad. Is it weird thinking you're going to be hopping on a plane soon and flying 24 hours to Australia? It's good weird. That's why I like I love being in a band because there's just weird wherever you wherever you look, you know. There's good weird and bad weird, but flying to Australia is there's a little bit of bad with a long flight and all that stuff, but it's a great deal to make, you know. It's it's well worth it, always. Especially, you know, it's very hard to whinge after, you know, two or so years of doing nothing, you know, and, and complaining about not being able to perform and, you know, record or whatever. It's uh, it's very hard to whinge about that. I think most people are whinged out, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> How'd you go? How'd you cope with all that, you know, downtime? I know you, had, you put the album out, obviously, but apart from that, I mean, you must have been, you know, tearing your hair out. Yeah, I'm still doing it. I've still got a nervous twitch, as you can see, but I'm still doing <laughs> yes. it. That's it. Um, it's funny, isn't it? The things you do physically, they always give telltale signs, don't they, as to your mental state. But I would say that I coped by, the same as most people, by going down multiple rabbit holes, just getting obsessed with certain things, certain people. For some reason, I got really into painters. Um well, I kind of know the reason, I think. My grandparents are both painters, and um, I just got really obsessed with people like Lucien Freud and Francis Bacon. <clears throat> and then I got really into Italian cinema. I didn't realize on Amazon. I know it's fashionable to slag off Amazon, but yeah. uh, they have an incredible selection of Italian cinema, 60s, 70s, 80s. So I got really into that, you know. So I guess escapism, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a lot of people actually left the city. I know, I know you did. You left London and, and you're up near sort of somewhere near Glastonbury. Is that, is that where you moved to? That's right. Somerset. I was in Somerset, the gentle countryside of Somerset. And it the good was, thing, uh, you know, it's nice to leave the city. The, the London would have been pretty scary, I think, for a little while, I can imagine. Yeah, London, you've got that collective anxiety. You know, you can't escape from it. But it was nice, you know, um, living in the countryside, uh, I enjoyed it. It gave a spring clean to my um, lungs, which had obviously suffered from living amidst all the pollution for 25 years in London. So I feel like that two-year spring clean was good. And now I'm back in London, but kind of on the outskirts, a place called Richmond, where it's a lot greener. There's a lot of parks here, and I'm encircled by the Thames. And I can even swim in this part of the Thames, quite close to where I am. Wow. Uh, they have a yeah, they have a swimming club. And also, uh, they're going to clean it up over the next few years. So that's great, because to me, if I get a swim in, like an outdoor swim, um, then it just changes the day. It makes the day, it, it gives me perspective. It makes me, you know, like I don't whinge so much, you know. <laughs> Look at you. You used to be all rock and roll. Now you're talking about going out for your daily swim and... It used to be all about getting over the hangover, you know? <laughs> well, you know something, the feeling after like a cold water swim isn't that dissimilar to walking off stage. So really it's a substitute. You know, it's for those times when I'm not on the road and I need to get that buzz, you know? Because sometimes it's quite, I'm certainly not expecting sympathy because I have the best job in the world. Being on tour is the best job in the world because you get, who else gets all that feedback from your day's work, you know? People applauding you, you get really spoiled, you know? Um, but when you're not doing that, it can be a bit lonely and isolating. And th- the other great part of being in the band is writing time. And that's what we're heading into now. We're going to head into writing time after Australia and we're going to work on the follow up to Motorhar. And this time we're all going to be in the same room as each other. That, that, that makes a big difference. I mean, it's, it was, it must have been extremely challenging doing things separately. I mean, it would have had its advantages, I'm sure, as well. But uh, you, you, you can't be properly creative uh, without the energy around you, but they're bouncing things off people. And um, it must have been, you know, must have been a challenge. Yeah, sometimes, you know, there's good and bad sides to it. You know, Justin, I think, enjoyed the <laughs> being kind of unmolested by the rest of us and yeah. able to be pure in his vision, perhaps. But at the same time, I think there is something to be said for four people tapping into the good parts of themselves and then all of you creating this, um, you know, all of you really bringing out the good or soulful part of yourself and creating something greater than all of you, you know. 
Yeah. And, and in fact, it's kind of, I, I forgot about this, in fact, until I was reminded, you know, a few hours ago, but yeah, the other album before uh, Motor Heart was Easter is cancelled. And then at the time, didn't think much of it, I guess, but then COVID happened and you were like, oh, <laughs> isn't that ironic anyway? Yeah, well, you know what happened? Um, one day, the newspaper, The Sun, that's owned by Murder, you know, you remember Murder, obviously. Yes. Um, the highest um, selling newspaper in the UK. And one day the headline was, Easter is cancelled because <laughs> Easter was cancelled. And that that was like a year and a half after our album came out. So, yeah, there was... Uh, the fact is, we didn't know why we called it Easter is cancelled. It was something our manager said in an email exchange and then Justin and I leapt on it and said, hey, wait a minute, that feels like it means something. We didn't know why, but it just feels like, what does it mean? And then just the... <laughs> Send back uh, this illustration of uh, Jesus snapping the cross, and and then we all laughed and thought, okay, yeah, we, we have to do this because it was a bit, it had a bit of Monty Python as well. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was actually it was a kind of a as many people described it a silly album. Um, and but you, you guys have always had that sense of humor with a lot of things you've done over the years, so it, it feels appropriate. Yeah, it's, it's probably actually also our most thoughtful album. This parts, it's definitely got the most ballads on it. It's probably the most um, uh, thoughtful and considered kind of album, you know, whereas um, Motor Heart was much more instinctive and off the cuff, which is cool because you get just silly things like nobody can see me cry, just silly things like that are kind of tossed off but are, are really kind of exciting and spontaneous. You know? So let's go back to when you guys first started and what made you go to become one of the great cock rock bands of all time. I mean, what, what, what sort of, um, was it something you decided upon or was it, was it just something you were taking a piss out of and then just went, this is working or, or what was it? I like that line. I've never heard that line before. I've heard cock rock being referenced, but I've never heard one of the best cock rock bands of all time. I think <laughs> that, should, that should be the header, you know? Yeah. That's got to be like somewhere. I almost feel like that could be the first line of our next press release. <laughs> <laughs> you can use that. Please do. That'd be great. One of the, um, I mean, that's a small element to what we do, really, you know, because we're not really, um, I don't think you can compare us with kind of Kiss and Motley Crue, really. It's a different kind of thing that we do. But there is a flavouring of that kind of music that we sometimes have. But we're not... You know, Cock Rock really is a very West Coast American thing, you know. And yeah. but 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 then again, the, these little term, these bits of terminology mean different things in different countries, don't they? Because you know, obviously, you're talking from Australian, so maybe it does make sense in, the, in Australian context. And also, it reminds me of that thing um, where glam rock is a different thing in um, in the states than it is in the UK. Glam rock in the UK is uh, sweet and. Uh, T-Rex, whereas in the States, it's as you know, it's like Motley Crue and everything, mm. you know. So, and, and Australia is sort of famous for its pub rock too. So it, it, you got that difference there as well. We don't really have that genre here at all. So you Australian know. pub, it, the Australian pub rock is without doubt the best in the world. And well, I mean, and so what were you listening to? Sort of, um, you know, I guess in the, the late eighties. Were you, were you listening to any in excess or or even Midnight Oil or anything like that? Yeah, I like some of that stuff. In the 80s, I was a moody teenager, so I was um, more listening to kind of alternative stuff, you know? Yeah. I was yeah. all that rubbish kind of indie stuff, you know? But when looking back, it was an incredible generation, you know, The Cure and The Smiths and New Order and Echo and the Bunnymen. It was an incredible uh, generation of bands and uh, so much talent. I mean, the, those four bands are so, so influential. Uh, they create like a lineage and changed music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then again, there's only so much whining you can take really after a while. I, I, I would say the band, uh, those four that actually have really gone, I know it's, most people would say the Smiths because they're very literary and, and, and almost academic, but I think the Cure actually are actually the great band of, of the eight, of the great alternative band of the, of the 80s. Because they they're one they're the most original. Nobody sounded like Robert Smith. Two, I think the songs 
um, don't need to be clever. They're just, uh, they can be played in, in any genre. They're, they're actually classic songs. And also the number of classic songs that Robert Smith wrote is actually uh, pretty astonishing. And the fact that they actually managed to release some really good music in the 90s as well, you know, that, that, that's really hard to progress from 80s alternative into the 90s. And not many got away with that. Yeah, they did. And also the stuff is really simple. Yeah. And the genius of, of managing to write something incredibly simple that's also really original. Very few people can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, going back to Aussie rock, I mean, Nick Cave might have had an influence on you as well, you know. Yeah, Nick Cave um, is incredible. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have gone to Nick Cave during lockdown. And um, he really is uh, the voice of reason now, you know. It's almost like <laughs> for the tennis community, he's almost like the voice of God now. He's almost replaced that, you know, for a lot of people. Yeah. But he does speak with a lot of authority and he's really matured um, in a very impressive way. And um, it's, I just think it's great that he celebrates um, this positivity now and reaching out and love, reaching in. And he's um, grown out of all of that cynicism. It's just one of the hardest things to do. It's almost, he's made it very clear and educated a lot of people that cynicism really is a crutch. And it shouldn't be like, it's okay to flavor things with a bit of cynicism and a sense of humor, but it's a toxic thing, you know, just to be cynical all the time, you know. And uh, he's taught people that. So I think that's a great thing that he's done. Yeah, it's so true because it was kind of his trademark in a way, was that. Um, and, and through the pandemic, these letters, these replies that he would do to fans and to kids, um, it did, it did bring out some amazing positivity and, and, and a side of Nick Cave we didn't necessarily know. And, and you're right, it was, it, was, it was really good. Yeah, he's really um, just embodies the, the idea of catharsis. You know? mm. He really does embody it. You know, it's, it's impressive. It's easy to... Um, Yeah, I mean, the way he's developed, really, he's just done the whole journey, hasn't he? You, have yeah. to, you, you can't not respect that. And even putting out a, you know, a few pop songs with Kylie Minogue, uh, you know, in the 90s, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. So, so you're about to come to, back to Australia. Um, is there anything, you know, on the checklist you like to do? Are there any bookshops you like to go to or music stores? or uh, I mean, when, when Americans come, they always want to go surfing, but I'm, I'm assuming you're not a surfer. I could be wrong. You can tell from my physique. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> we have surfed a little bit. If you watch the video to all the pretty girls, you can see um, Dan playing his guitar on the surfboard. Yeah, yeah. I have to go <laughs> back and see them. A guy that looks very similar to Dan. Um, and we actually surfed in Cornwall, and uh, myself and Justin were both up on the boards and everything. And I've surfed a bit in Ecuador as well, but obviously I'm not like a... I'm not going to pretend that I'm any good at it. You know, I can stay up on the board. By Australian standards, I'm a very average surfer. But I would like to swim uh, whenever I can, especially in Adelaide with the crystal clear waters. Mm. And I'd like to obviously go to Cherry Bar in Melbourne and maybe Frankie's in Sydney. And yeah, just really see if there's any good rock and roll bars still around, you know, because I know it's tough times now in Australia. Everyone's cracking down, which I'm really uh, sad about, you know. Yeah. Well, well, Cherry Bar in Melbourne is is definitely, you know, iconic and, and it's got the, uh, as you said, the, the lineage from um, uh, ACDC in a way, you know, with uh, the young family, you know, in involved in Cherry. But, but, Frankie's is, is just an incredible bar as well. And I got some sad news. Frankie's is closing. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Why? What's the excuse they've given? Well, th- th- this is actually a fair one. They're actually building a subway. <laughs> and Frankie's, unfortunately, is in the spot where the subway station is popping out. And The thing is, when you rebuild places, like, for example, the colony rooms in London, these iconic places, you can't redo them, you know, mm. because because there's something about the place. There's a reason why people went to those places in the first place. And uh, and you can't r- rationally, when you try and do it, you just can't recreate it, you know. It's, it, it's almost never the same. But I really hope that they managed to... Are they planning to do a new one? 
yeah, I think they're trying to move somewhere. And you're right, it, it's never quite the same, but I think Frankie's might be the one place where they can they can try and recreate it somewhere. But there aren't many great rock bars in Sydney. Jesus, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. It's unbelievable. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a generation of really great kind of punky bands coming through, isn't there, you know, in their early 20s and everything. And I'm pretty sure that they're going to kind of, uh, with those bands, there's going to um, come kind of places, bars, locations where these people hang out. You know? I mean, there are already, you know, but hopefully they'll get bigger and they'll become iconic, you know, and yeah. the whole circle start again. Yeah? Well, Frankie's one of the, the great bars where it didn't matter what day it was, you, you could just go down there and you'd make friends and you'd see a band. And, and I mean, live karaoke is one of the best things they did. They had the Frankie's house band with the lyrics and they would do live karaoke. I mean, that's such one of the coolest things ever. How much longer has it got? Not long. I think only a few months. So, so you're going to make it, you're going to make it for one final drink for sure. We'll be singing back to the cherry bar. Unbelievable. Um, but I look forward to, I love the little cozy little bar downstairs. Yeah. That was, I was going to ask you about that. Whether you've been to the little, you know, the, the corner bar around the back, you know, downstairs, there's something kind of, kind of cool about that little secret bar they've it. got there. Yeah, it's a lovely little snug little place, you know. I feel like I'm in a Scorsese film when I'm in there, you know. It's like <laughs> it's right. So I've got to ask you, what's a new rider? Because, I mean, some bands have been extravagant in certain years and they reel it back because they realise that um, you actually are paying for the rider. It's not uh, someone else, you know. So what are you having it these days? You have to be careful with how you describe things uh, because... Uh, you can ask for um, uh, for the word good doesn't mean anything because whoever's buying the shopping will just think good good to them is different to what's good to you, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you have to say like four perfect avocados, ripe, you know, four perfect ripe avocados because what really frustrates you is you just get like brick hard bits of fruit and, and avocados that you just can't eat, you know? Yeah. And you can't yeah. even bite them have a little dressing room fight with me because because they're too hard they knock someone out you know? so uh, and then i guess we go for quality now rather than quantity so we get one bottle of chateau neuf de pack but uh french wine mm. uh, but we do that when it's kind of autumn and winter you don't need one that in the heat of the summer so then we might switch to like a nice white wine in the summer because it's only really me and Dan that drink the white wine. Uh, um, that drink wine. There's obviously beers, uh, almonds, but like stuff, food that gives you energy. You know that you need. You know superfoods. I know that doesn't sound rock and roll, but <laughs> you need that <laughs> fuel. You need that fuel, especially when you're in Australia. You get really. Uh, you're catching up in your jet lag, so you, you need that stuff. You need bananas, blueberries, almonds. And kombucha, Justin uh, gets obsessed with things. He's very, um, I wouldn't say OCD, but he, he, he kind of fixates on certain things in different periods of time. And at the moment, he's going through a kombucha phase and he can down three bottles just like that, you know. And then he just uh, has his manic energy and takes it out on the um, crowd. <laughs> and, and one thing I've, I didn't realise until someone recently told me as well is you've got to be careful you know, not to have too many garlicky things in you or onion um, in your rider because um, you, you, if you're doing meet and greets with people, you're going to stink like garlic. Yeah, well, we used to have, we had this, uh, we got really obsessed with garlic once and passed and we had this um, tour manager who would bring a huge pan, um, Zoe, she was called, she would bring a huge pan, four plates, four knives and forks, and she would promise us that no matter what venue we were playing, she could find all she needed was a, a kitchen and one stove, one gas, one gas hob, and she could make us um, spaghetti al oglio, you know, which is just the garlic and the olive oil with a bit yes. of parmesan on top. And yep. she would do it with butter, butter, garlic, and we had it, and we would look forward to it because it's really Moorish that. And after, after a show, you come off stage and you're starving because we don't eat three hours, four hours before a show. So we've got more energy. Um, and we would just be craving it and we got hooked on it and, but then we would have like guests and I remember we would have um, guests would come in and, and they'd be like Jesus and after some of us had used the bathroom as well the combination of that and the garlic um, we started to see people squirming a little bit when they came in so we would be <laughs> sitting 
okay, we, uh, we got to stop this. Because the thing about that is if you don't notice, if you're eating it all the time, you, um, you don't notice. So we're all just um, indulging each other's uh, horrific garlic breath. <laughs> That's the thing. No one's going to tell you because no one's, no one's noticing. Um, I went yeah. to a music festival recently where I was watching what the bands were up to when they were coming off stage and some bands sort of went off separately and, and other bands had a debrief and sat, sat down together and had a meal and, and we're in the middle of the desert, like right in the outback where they film Mad Max to give you an idea. And people were coming off stage, having a meal together as a band and they were eating like lamb ragu and it was one of the most random thing ever, but it was just the, the catering was so good. You would have been impressed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, with us, it, it can vary. You know, it really can vary. In France, they really look after you nicely. Yeah, but when you're on tour there, you know, um, backstage food and everything. It's nice. Some some venues actually cook you like a hot meal, um, soup and stuff like soup is great. You know, when it's homemade and it's made in the venue. Yeah, I've That's heard a- Germany's good for that. Where they they sort of feed you along the way, particularly when you're a, a band like doing tour bus life. Um, I guess it is all about you know, getting fed properly before you jump on the tour bus and travel to the next country. Yeah, the Germans are very really conscientious. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I hope we treat you properly over here because you've got a whole bunch of uh, concert dates coming up in October. Um, you're starting in Melbourne and then going through to Canberra. I- I've got to mention Canberra. You're going to love Canberra. It's A lot of people bag it out, but it is the national capital. It's a beautiful town, great restaurants. So, you know, don't just um, fall into the trap of, not spending a night in Canberra. Make sure you go out and, and check the joint out. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Yeah. Well, Appreciate it. Good talking to you. Frankie, it was good to meet you and uh, I will see you in a few weeks. See you. Pleasure talking to you.